Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we consider functions with several variables and where we calculate their extrema. And indeed, in today's part 29, we will discuss how we can calculate extrema under constraints with the so-called method of Lagrange. In particular, we will write down the proof of it for a function in two dimensions. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And I should tell you, it's really worth being a supporter, because then you have full access to my website. And there you find additional material like books, quizzes and PDF versions. Ok, with that said, let's recall the method of Lagrange multipliers in R2. As mentioned in the last video, we discussed this two-dimensional case first, because it's easy to visualize. So what we have here is just two C1 functions, where the function f is the one we are interested in and g gives the constraint. More precisely, the constraint is given for the points x that satisfy g of x is equal to 0. Hence, only on this contour line given by g, we search for extrema of the function f. And now the method of Lagrange multipliers gives us a necessary condition for such a local extremum if the contour line of G here is nice enough. Which simply means that there is no point where the gradient of G completely vanishes. In other words, if we assume these two conditions here, we have an implication. Namely, we find that the gradient of F and the gradient of G lie in the same one-dimensional subspace. Hence, at this point x tilde, we find a real number lambda, which we call the Lagrange multiplier. And then the only difference between the two gradients here is this scalar lambda. Ok, and this is the theorem we want to prove now. And we will see that we just need the implicit function theorem for it. Ok, so we have two conditions here at the point x tilde, so let's assume this is condition 1 and the other one is condition 2. And there we see that condition 1 allows us to apply the implicit function theorem for g. So we have that g of x1 and x2 is equal to 0. And we have that at least one partial derivative of g at this point is not equal to 0. Therefore, the implicit function theorem allows us to rewrite this contour line as a graph of a function. At least we have that locally around the point x tilde. So let's say here we have our x tilde and then this is a graph of a function where x1 is the independent variable. However, you know we could also have x2 as the independent variable depending where the gradient here has a zero component. Hence we actually have two possible cases. Either we have x1 is equal to a function and maybe let's call this one beta of x2. Or we have x2 is equal to a function of x1. And maybe this one we simply call gamma. So actually we have to write down a proof for each of the two cases, but because they look so similar, the proof will be actually the same. Therefore let's simply focus on the second case here and let's continue the proof. And now the implicit function theorem also tells us that we can put this function gamma into the function g. So we have this is equal to 0 for all x1 in a neighborhood of x tilde. So we have an open neighborhood in R for x1. So maybe let's call this open set u. So it's not important at all how big u is, it's just important that the first component of x tilde lies in this open set u. And then locally around this point, everything is nice. And moreover, the implicit function theorem also tells us that gamma is a C1 function as well. Hence, it's allowed to differentiate both sides of the equation here. Indeed, we have a function of one variable x1 here, so we can calculate the derivative with respect to x1. Hence, on the right hand side, we still have zero, but on the left hand side, we can use the chain rule. And the chain rule works 
because we have a composition of the function g with this function inside. So what we get is the Jacobian of the function g and we evaluate it at the same point. And then we multiply this matrix with the Jacobian of the function inside, which is simply a 2 times 1 matrix. And obviously it's simply 1 and gamma prime. And moreover, you know instead of the Jacobian, we can also use the gradient of g. And if we do that, we have the standard inner product here. And by our calculation here, we see that this inner product is 0. So in other words, we have that the gradient of g is orthogonal to this vector here. And we get that this orthogonality holds for all points in the open set u. Ok, then let's continue the proof with our second condition. This one now implies that we can consider a new function f hat, which is just defined on the set u and the restriction of f to the contour line of g. This means f hat of x1 is given by the function f with two inputs, where the first one is x1 and the second one is our gamma of x1. So it's also a composition and therefore a c1 function as well. However, now the condition 2 tells us that this function has a local extremum at x tilde. Or more precisely, it has a local extremum at x1 tilde, where x1 tilde is the first component of x tilde. So this is the next conclusion we have here. We have a one-dimensional function which has a local extremum at a given point. And there we can use our knowledge of the necessary condition for local extrema. This is really simple. We know that the derivative at this given point has to vanish. So in other words here, we can use the chain rule again. So we get the same calculation as before, but instead of the gradient of g, we get the gradient of f. And most importantly, we have everything here at the point x1 tilde. However, at this point we know that gamma of x1 tilde is exactly x2 tilde. Therefore, here we have a claim for the gradient of f at the point x tilde. But we have the same claim here for the gradient of g, because this equation here holds for all x1 in u. So in particular, it also holds for the point x1 tilde. So in summary, we get that the gradient of f and the gradient of g at the point x tilde are orthogonal to the same vector. And since everything here lives in R2, we don't have much choice for the two gradients. So if we visualize this vector with gamma, then we immediately see that the orthogonal complement of this vector is a one-dimensional subspace in R2. So the gradient of f and the gradient of g have to lie inside this one-dimensional subspace. Which finishes our proof, both gradients here only differ by a Lagrange multiplier lambda. And with that we have it, now you have seen that the method of Lagrange multipliers is not magic at all, it immediately follows from the implicit function theorem. And since we have this nice implicit function theorem not only in R2, but in the general version, we can also use that to prove a more general version of the method of Lagrange multipliers as well. The idea here is exactly the same, but now the function f can have n inputs. And then nothing really changes, just that the constraint g also needs to have n inputs as well. However, since in Rn we have much more freedom than just in R2, we can also consider more than just one constraint. So we could say that we have m different functions g, j. So the index j here runs from 1 to m. So in short, we could just say that we have one c1 function g that maps into rm. Indeed, if we do that, we can still say that our constraint is given by g is equal to 0. The only difference then is that this 0 denotes the 0 vector in rm. So again, here, when we say that f has a local extremum subject to the constraint g is equal to 0, means that we have m different constraints. 
So it's a generalization with two parts, but it actually looks the same as before. However, now the second assumption has to look a little bit different because G does not have a gradient anymore. So now we have to consider the Jacobian of G at the point X tilde. Now the Jacobian is a matrix, but in general it's not a square matrix. But we know that in the rows of the Jacobian we find the gradients of the functions g, j. And now we want, similarly to before, that these span a nice subspace in Rn. So before we wanted a one-dimensional subspace, but here we need now an m-dimensional subspace. Hence we get that the rank of this Jacobian matrix should be equal to m. So you could say we want to have the maximal rank for this Jacobian. And you should already know why we have to assume that, because we want to apply the implicit function theorem. And there we always consider a partial Jacobian inside, which should be invertible. This is exactly what the implicit function theorem needs as an input. And with that we get the same thing out as before, namely that the gradient of f at the point x tilde lies in this m-dimensional subspace spanned by the gradients of g, j. And one possibility to write that down is to say that this gradient is given by a linear combination. So we have scalars lambda j and j goes from 1 to m. Therefore, in this case we find exactly m Lagrange multipliers. So the name is exactly the same, but now we have to remember that we need as many Lagrange multipliers as we have constraints. And also that we have a whole linear combination here for the gradient of f at the point x tilde. And now I can tell you that we can simply adapt the proof from before for this general version as well. Indeed, we just have to use the chain rule, the implicit function theorem and this perpendicular claim in the end for more variables. And since all the ideas are already there, we don't need to go into the technical details of the proof of this version now. I think it's much more helpful to consider an example now. But I would say this one we discuss in the next video, so I really hope we meet there again. Have a nice day and bye bye. Thank you.